for coming on a sunny day. <laughs> that is so awesome uh, to be here. So I'm glad we get some light coming into this uh, room. So that's really nice. Uh, I was here last month and really enjoyed that presentation. And so, and more, I enjoyed even the conversation after. So really, you know, I'll speak for about half hour. And my goal is really to set up something for a conversation for us. So um, I run a design office in town. It's called uh, Authentic Design. Briefly, my background is that I spent a long time at Microsoft as director of user experience of uh, the design excellence team. And uh, um, before Microsoft, I was a tenured professor of design at the University of Illinois. And I'm an industrial designer. I run my industrial design consulting business. And so I've got a mix of academic and practitioner uh, background. And now I run authentic design. So as Stephen mentioned, there was that hackathon which really had this huge impact on me. And today, what I want to share with you is some of the things that I, um, that I learned during that process, during my time at Microsoft and that hackathon, which has led me on a journey to create something which, you know, honestly, I'm quite astonished by uh, personally. So I've created a platform that's called Design Swarms, which is now, uh, you know, been working on only for about, uh, uh, authentic is only about three and a half years old, but we've just seen this extraordinary adoption of this platform. And uh, we've seen it by uh, companies around the world, it is used by academia around the world, it's being used by nonprofits, and pretty much this is a gamification of the design thinking process. And I have had a chance now to lead uh, these efforts now on every continent except the Antarctic. So my next goal is somewhere there's a group of penguins <laughs> who really care about design thinking. And I hope to get in front of them sometime, right? So that's what I want, I want to share with you. I think this is, you know, um, uh, this appears to be very timely and it appears to be something that is elastic and usable across whether it is for profit, non profit whether it's education, and you know, it's so, in some ways it is about our times where things are changing so fast, right? We're moving at such high velocity and we're moving to a place which is very design-centered. And so there's uh, something. So going back to Microsoft, right? <laughs> There was a time at Microsoft, and you remember this, uh, um, those ads, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. Oh boy, those stung, right? They stung because at that time, they were true, right? What had happened was we were this technology company, this dominant technology company that had invented so many of the key technologies, right? The company that practically birthed the software revolution, unleash the power of the microprocessor. But then we found ourselves at this place where we're in the edge of uh, irrelevance, right? And making products that look like that, right? And then I got to participate and be one of the people leading the process where we went from that to becoming a company that truly had soaked in design and design thinking deeply and turn into a design leader. That whole process took about nine years from beginning to end. And it was a, a long process, a lot of lessons learned. And for me, I had this privilege of my life to be able to build programs that reached like 25,000 people, design programs that reached this very broad scale. And one of the things that I learned through that process was in this very large company, this 120,000 person company, to build this capability, this capability of design to be able to compete in the experience economy, we had to be very strategic. We had to be strategic about thinking about the different levels of design and actually get everyone in the company involved in the design project. Where there was a core of people, maybe a few thousand people, who would, had design mastery right at the center. These are people 
deeply trained in design and they understood, you know, they were creating all this kind of beautiful stuff, creating the new frameworks. And then there was a layer of people who were design fluent, who were partners in the design project, right? Who were PMs and devs and folks in localization, folks in content, but all who understood that we're using a design thinking scaffold to be able to create things that we could compete. And then finally, there was everybody, including everybody, including everybody in the company who had to be design literate. Design literate knowing that there is something in the world called design. It's a different way of approaching the world which does not start business first, does not start technology first, is not about the logic of construction, but it's rather the logic of use. Right? And once you get that, which one can understand even in like an hour webinar, right? That design literacy, the game changes. And this, I believe, is the arc that Microsoft went through from being a company that was involved in the logic of construction to now it is involved, a company in the logic of use and the logic of humans. And you know, one of the things that struck me, I'd spent 16 years at Microsoft, and one of the things that struck me, you know, this thing I've seen, this design thinking approach that I've seen that has transformed this largest, most valuable company. Could this approach, act, now, this is the origin story behind this method I'm moving to. This, I think, what about all those things that existed outside the bubble of Microsoft? We live in these extraordinary times where we're seeing lots of things going on. The environment's in trouble. We see a lot of extinction. We start to see uh, resources. We see pollution. All the Can the same kind of approach be used in broader ways? And so I was very curious to do that because we are at this moment, we're at this fork. We're at this fork between utopia and dystopia. We still have a choice, but the window keeps shrinking. Okay, what can we take this approach that we had got the very systematic scaffold at Microsoft uh, actually take them broader? And one of the, again, one of the privileges for me was the things that I learned at Microsoft, the opportunities I got to really drive this culture, drive cultures such as prototyping, the idea of customer centricity, and the sponsorship of this very enlightened CEO that we'd got. And one of the things that, because I was part of the central team, we got the privilege to do was organize this hackathon. And at that hackathon, something quite remarkable happened. There were probably about 20,000 people who participated in the hackathon. And I happened to witness some of the projects that were you know, truly impactful. And this one really blew my mind. This is a project called um, the uh, Eye Gaze Project. And the idea of this project is how can you enable somebody who, with ALS who has lost all physical ability except the ability to move their eyes, right? And ALS is a particularly cruel disease because it leaves your mind intact. And is it possible to make, give them independent mobility? And this team worked on this, and in 38 hours, they had created this wheelchair that could be driven around with just the eyeballs, right? I said, this is, something happened here. Something happened here. Not only did we have this kind of, you know, what I witnessed, not just a sort of design-centric approach, but there was more. There was this more, this approach where it was not a waterfall approach. It was an approach about the collision of different ideas in very creative ways that in 38 hours could solve such an incredibly difficult problem. And as I looked more into it, it was what I was bumping into really was what I can call swarm creativity. This kind of emergent creativity that happens when you have the right scaffold and you have people in the room who are goal-oriented and we embrace the chaos, but we create structure that moves us to results and know that we have to do whatever it takes to allow creativity to take place. And so this was an interesting turn. So if one could use this idea of swarm creativity, yes, on this planet with all these thousands of wicked problems, we do have billions of creative minds. 
So what if we can take those, exactly those kind of scaffolds that, you know, drove this transformation of this company and the other companies and actually be able to turn that into heuristics in some ways that everybody could uh, adopt? And so that was kind of the quest. And I was curious to say, is that hypothesis, right? Is there really that much creativity in the world? And I started looking around then. So yes, there is. For example, this is Richard Torere. Richard Torere is a young Maasai boy who lives on the plains of Kenya. And he is not terribly educated. And his job is his parents. He's nine years old. His job is to keep the cattle safe from the lions. And his parents send him out and say, make sure the lions don't eat the cattle. And so the other Maasai boys, the way they take care of that problem is they lace a piece of meat with uh, pesticides and poisons. And the lions eat it and die. And Richard is saying, but I like the lions. I need to find a different way. And then he, this uh, young man, experimented. And he came up with this contraption which actually set up these blinking lights when lions were close by and it chased the lions away, cattle were safe, lions were safe too. So this is an uneducated Maasai boy, hundreds of miles from anything close to an education with this raw creativity in his mind that is just waiting to be unleashed, right? And so this scaffold called design thinking the privilege in my life has been, I've learned this heuristic. I have designed automobiles, I have designed software interfaces, I've designed learning, and I've designed spaces. And I've designed furniture, I've designed a whole bunch of it. But I've used only one process. And that process is the design thinking process. A systematic, elastic, repeatable process you can apply to any problem and you're assured of a result. And not just a result, but a innovative and often disruptive result. It's not rocket science. It takes some time to internalize it. And it has a few stages, somewhere depending on who phrases it, between five and seven stages. So, so can we somehow be able to take this process and make this available to everyone, every Richard Terraria on the planet? And I had this breakthrough. I was traveling in Australia, in the middle of Australia. Uh, this is the red heart of Australia, and the red heart of Australia is a big rock called Uluru. And Uluru is the sacred rock of the Pitinjajara people who live there. And this is where the oldest civilization on the planet lives. They've been there for 22 and a half thousand years. But they don't have a written language, or they have a rather very basic written language. But still, they are the longest civilization on our planet, and they're incredibly creative. I was curious, how is this happening? And as you go close to a rock, you find that the entire surface of the rock has these drawings, and this is how knowledge is not only transferred, but this is how it is negotiated. But the whole notion of canvas, a canvas on which knowledge can be negotiated, actually brought, connected me back to one of the principles of design thinking, which is every time you do a project, build a museum, right? And so this is one of the principles. And what it is really is about embodying creativity outside the brains into a social context where we can all participate. And the notion of taking that creative, creativity outside. And so I said, hey, that's, a, that's pretty cool. What if I take the design thinking process and turn it into a game? And so the first, this, I created this. This is the first version of it. This was 10 feet wide, 4 feet high. It was a design swarms uh, um, uh, game board. And the whole notion of this, these are the different, you see the different stages. Orient, frame, ideate, iterate, and optimize. Right? You learn this in the first year of design school. Right? But now everybody can play this game together. So I said, okay, here I've, I've got something. This looks cool. Will it work? Can we take a really edge case problem, again, of people who are not designers, have them use it, and let's see what happens. Now, it turned out that one of the opportunities showed up right in our city. In fact, when I was walking here downstairs, Marty from Mary's Place was talking downstairs. And Mary's Place is the women's shelter in town. And so partnered with them, said, you know, this is the day, time that the mayor had declared an emergency in our city. And so we worked with the um, folks at Mary's Place who had experienced homelessness, had zero design knowledge, 
probably didn't even know something called design existed. But by using this approach, they were able to really come to the core of the, uh, the problem. I mean, typically, if you use a business thinking lens or a engineering thinking lens, you'd say 500 women out on the streets every night build more shelters, right, to accommodate them. But it turns out that what these folks discovered when they came to it from a human-centric point of view with the lived knowledge was, it turns out oftentimes when somebody flees at two at night, it doesn't matter the whole bunch of shelters because you need to authenticate yourself because you can get into any of them. And so they decided to focus on building something within that day called Identity Haven, a way to store your information in the cloud, right? And so if something happens where you have to flee home, you have access to it and you're in a shelter. So this is the magic of design thinking. It lets you find the pivot point to be able to get in, right? And so I took that process and then I took it around the world and tried it in a number of different problems. And I was astonished with just this very lean approach and most often in just a day, how we were able to really crack very difficult problems. And I also learned things along the way, which is, you know, primarily our model of design and our model of innovation has been one about a minority that builds for a majority. That minority lives in elitist places such as corporations and then serves people who are the recipients of that, that we call customers and users and so on, right? And with the velocity that we move at, with the complexity we move at, with the dynamic nature of problems that we have, there's a huge opportunity to harness all the wasted creative capital that exists on the planet. And also within organizations, each organization tends to delegate the, prob the job of actually solving problems to a small minority of people. If we can start to unleash the creative, ca creative capacity hidden in organizations, we can not only increase velocity, but when we can bring lived knowledge into it, we can make, have better product uh, market fit. So really, the opportunity is there is this huge creative capital that is just waiting to be unleashed. And, you know, and what I had seemed to have found was a simple way to be able to get at that. So there's a vision of authentic, which is really the notion, uh, the fundamental notion is a design powered planet where everybody gets a chance to participate in the design project and go use this kind of very elegant approach to problem solving that we call the design thinking approach. And the mission is to really help every human and every organization unleash their inner design thinker. I believe that everyone is creative. I believe that is just waiting to be unleashed. What they miss are the scaffolds. So the other discovery I made as I went through this was there was this one um, uh, game board, but then different problems look different. Some problems look like this, where you need some discovery up front. Other problems require a lot of iteration later. And some problems are just very challenging, <laughs> right? And I found that having to adapt this process each time right, when I led and facilitated different groups. And so I said, hey, you know, why not have a Lego kit? And so this is a Lego kit of these game boards that have gamified the design thinking process. So sometimes when you meet a problem like this, you just use a different set of the kit. And sometimes you might use a different part of the kit. Sometimes you have very little time. You know, you might just have a half a day or a day. So you can just use a part of it, the minimum set. You know, that's what that looks like. So that is this three mod, three Lego pieces that are set, um, uh, come together. And that goes through the ent entire design thinking process, which begins at one end. You know, they all go, you start from there to there, there to there, there to there. And you begin with understanding, gaining empathy, framing problems, creating ideas, picking the best ideas, uh, building out a, what I call a minimum viable experience, and then testing it with customers. And this is something, this cycle is extremely short. The entire cycle from the very beginning of co-design, bringing customers in, 
working with them, working with them through this, to building something out and testing it is less than a week. No? So this is also a very high velocity process. So here's the anatomy of one, what e, you know, each of these game boards look like. So you always have an entry and exit. In this case, we see the entry is gain empathy to discover opportunities. Right? You, when we are you, being human-centric, we have to start with empathy. Right? And there are timed activities that you run through. And this is as a leader. And I make a distinction between being a facilitator and a leader because when I am there in a group, it is not passive. I am there full skin in the game as a leader and a co-designer working with that. And because I occupy that center of that uh, uh, the three-circle diagram, right? And so there is the idea of leading these sprints. And they're very short, just 10 to 30 minutes long. And their mindsets, the different mindsets in design thinking are captured on the sides. You know, so here we see engage often to learn, data-driven empathy. And their cycles of learn, do, and share. It's a very lightweight kit. It has, you know, some game pieces. Some of them are posted, some of them are other game pieces. There is sometimes a mural aspect to it. Mural is a shared uh, uh, visual surface where remote people can mark up things and so on. And, you know, it looks like this when people have worked through this. In this case, this entire thing is all in Spanish. I speak some Spanish, but not a lot. But I found that it doesn't seem to matter because the process is so visual. I have now taught it to folks in Japanese and to folks in Spanish. I speak zero Japanese, a little bit of Spanish, but we came to a result. And so now the, also the uh, process is available in multiple languages to allow people of different languages to be able to uh, participate in this process. There is also a, if I get this to work, the Wi-Fi wasn't great here. There's also a, uh, um, uh, there's, an, there's an app that people can use to uh, be, um, to sort of coach themselves in one minute uh, uh, learning segments. Um, and I'm gonna take you through a very quick example of what this actually feels like when this is facilitated. So this is, a, this is what it feels like during a workshop when people are using these game boards. So here's an example. This was working with folks in Ohio where there is one opioid death every 11 minutes. And the problem here that we were working on was how prevention's better than cure, design challenge come up with a disruptive, innovative solution to focus on prevention of addiction. Right? So in the room, we have folks who are emergency room physicians, we have frontline responders, we have people who have first-hand knowledge of addiction, and together we're coming up with these ideas. So as we're going through this process, teams have come together, they have uh, gone through a superpower inventory, balanced team, so they're each team, there's six teams, and the teams, thank you, sir, uh, each team has uh, um, uh, discovered its uh, powers, they have interviewed uh, people who've experienced the opioid addiction and they have actually defined a persona and a day in the life based on real data. They go through a user journey mapping and they start to extract from that some of the key challenges and opportunities and they develop, they start to extract needs and they take those needs, prioritize those needs uncover the most important needs, and from those needs they do that very important thing that designers do is flip them into human-centered goals. And when they've gone to that, they then move to, they've got to the goal they're going to work on, right? In this case, it does cr create a means to prevent Brian's addiction to drugs. And so this is where I'm gonna give you a short a snippet of what actually they experience you know, we've probably gone through about four hours to get to this point. And so here, this is actually what people in a workshop are seeing. Here, you need to create disruptive ideas to achieve your goal. And so then I show an example of a disruptive idea. This talks about how in Africa, when the sun goes down, this is the scene in most homes. The kerosene lanterns come out because about 10% of Africa is on the electric grid, right? 
But these are bad solutions because these explode and kill people. They're very polluting. It's like smoking two packets of cigarettes, one of these in one night, right? But the challenge, of course, is you can't just create an electric grid in Africa because Africa is huge, right? You can put all the US and all of Europe, all of Japan, all of India, and there's still room to spare in Africa, <laughs> right? So obviously, you can't throw an engineering solution on this and just say, we'll throw, uh, we'll put an electric grid. You need to find a different way to approach it. From a design thinking approach, a group of students went to Africa and they traveled around and came, found the human intervention to it. And what did they find? They found there's one thing common across all African countries, and that was soccer. And based on that, they created something called a socket, which is a soccer ball with a battery in it. You play soccer for one, uh, one game and lights your home for all night. So now, as a team, they're challenged. You need to get socket level ideas. This is about disruption. But now to do that, you have to adopt some mindsets. So they learn about mindsets. Then they actually learn what they are going to do, which is, there's a, I won't go through the detail, but they learn about a particular technique, which is called biomimicry. And they learn about our helicopter actually created by mimicking a maple seed pod. And then they learn about other examples of biomimicry, you know, and those results that came from that. And then they challenge to take their own problem and use biomimicry to solve preventing access to drugs for Brian. Right? And so now they're looking at a, a number of different examples of carefully selected triggers, in this case, is a butterfly, right? And each of these examples, for example, butterflies, the beautiful thing there from a biomimicry part of it is the notion of metamorphosis, right? So they have these triggers and they go through that. Then they go ahead, pick those ideas, and then they learn how to use a visual to advantage. They learned how to, a systematic way to transfer those ideas into these segments, these atomic idea pieces. And then they learn something called idea harvesting, where they learn to exchange ideas and do what I call radical collaboration. And so they've gone through this process. Then they learn in this segment that is happening probably in about an hour. They're learning how to evaluate ideas. And they're learning how to actually, there's another example of how the birth, how the wine press and uh, the uh, uh, coin punch and wine press came together to form the movable type uh, uh, typing press by Gutenberg. And they are taught about, you know, here's some examples today, how the WeFit again uses this bringing together and smashing different ideas together to create value. And they learn the idea of creating concepts by marrying different ideas. And then they get a way to then evaluate ideas in a very systematic way to figure out what ideas are more valuable by feasibility and comfort. So that is the experience they've had. They've gone through this. They've gained empathy. And then they've understood what needs are. They've understood what design goals are. They've created ideas. They've found and evaluated the best ideas. And then as they move through it, they learn how to validate it. And they learn how to storyboard it. And pitch it and write a scenario for it. And in fact, one of the ideas here, the idea for solving Brian's problem was something called Prime Rx. It turns out the discovery that happened was most addicts are actually accidental addicts because pills are dispensed in 60s when people need only about eight. It is teenagers who are experimenting with these things that tend to get addicted. And so the idea was Prime Rx was that Amazon would deliver only four pills every day and there are no spare pills that takes care of a big bunch of the addiction problem, right? So this is formed by people who are non-designers. This is very important. This astounding design solution comes from no design knowledge. It's just using this method. So in any case, um, you know, to wrap here, so the belief here that I'm basing this on, which, you know, works in for business, works for nonprofit, works for education, I believe all people are creative. And I believe that when people can channel this creativity, this creative power, they can do incredible things for themselves, their communities, and even for the world. And that framework is the design thinking process, right? And the design thinking process directs that. So the process is called design swarms. 
And that is what uh, I mentioned is now seeing adoption everywhere. And just to end, I will see if I can get this uh, uh, app to load. Yes. So um, this is what. Uh, so this is what these. There are these short um, videos now. Here. So that's an example of uh, one of these. So the idea is really to build, you know, there are probably about 25 right now is to keep building all of these. So I will stop at this point, but I do have uh, an example of what these look like. They all have the same size. They're all 24 by 36 inches, right? And uh, so at this moment, there are 15 different uh, uh, game boards and so on and the library continues to increase and they have this physical form and they have a digital form um, uh, that lives um, at the moment in mural. All right, thank you for listening and you're welcome to uh, here, I'll pass these around.